Thank you, Joe. Good afternoon, everybody. I was terrified watching Secretary Hunt that he was going to fall off the steps, so I'm going to stay right back in case I worry about myself. Um, I'm going to be talking a little bit about the WHO's medication safety challenge. You've already heard about the scale of the uh, problem of medication safety worldwide, medication error, both in uh, human terms and in economic terms. But really, as we've all found when we're relating to this subject and trying to find ways of inspiring people and um, galvanizing action, is when we look at the granularity that we start to see how this is affecting real people and, and why it's such an urgent need to address it. This little baby was born in a hospital in the UK um, in the mid-2000s, and she had a congenital heart abnormality that needed major heart surgery, but it was something that was treatable. Um, and for all children, and indeed adults in these situations, when you have heart surgery, you usually need an anticoagulant at some point in your care. And she was prescribed 1,500 uh, units of heparin. That was what she needed. That was the way the prescription was written. That was the way the prescription was given. An error which killed her, um, 15,000 of units of heparin given because the abbreviation U for units was used. An error that's happened not just in the UK, but in other parts of the world as well. This lady's face and name will be well known to many of you, especially those of you from the United States. Betsy Lehman, the award-winning um, health economist of the Boston Globe. She was treated in her local hospital in Boston, a major teaching center. She had breast cancer. She was put on an experimental cancer drug. Uh, there was a clear protocol for it. Um, and um, the calculation of the dose was by the patient's body surface area. And the calculation was performed. And she received four times uh, the proper dose over four consecutive days. Um, and um, she died. Twelve different people, a mixture of pharmacists, doctors, and nurses, countersigned these dosage calculations. Another woman on the same experimental uh, drug therapy for cancer had the same treatment, and she also got four times the intended dose over a four-day period, and she was severely harmed. She didn't die, um, but um, both patients were given another drug to, calc to counteract the side effects of the cancer chemotherapy, and they each received four times the dose of that as well. There was a major um, media furor against the hospital. You can imagine the reporter of the local newspaper, one of their own, had been killed by the local hospital that she'd written about in positive terms many times. And Dana Farber uh, was subject to all sorts of regulatory action and fines. But it is one of the hospitals in the world, for those of you who know it, that used the um, occurrence of Betsy Lehman's death to transform their approach to patient-centered care and to genuinely uh, transform it. And I'd like to step aside just a second from the medication safety story there, just to make two general points about um, patient safety. And there are all sorts of things, and I've been involved in this for a long, long time now, both in the UK when I was chief medical officer, before that when I was a regional director in the NHS, and then subsequently in the WHO program since 2006. There are many, many unanswered questions, some of them very, very profound. And one of them is, when a tragic event like this happens, why is it that some hospitals dedicate themselves to transform permanently and some regard it as a sad moment that they have an inquiry report, they try and learn, but really their practice, their culture, their ways of doing things doesn't change at all? Why, why such a difference? 
And why is it that other industries, when an aeroplane comes down or a nuclear plant, that there is a major, often industry-wide transformation? But what you see in relation to patient safety is that not only do you not get an industry-wide transformation, you don't even get an institution-wide transformation, and it's the minority that those occurs. So that's one of the, if you like, there are many unanswered problems and questions in patient safety that I've encountered, and that's one of them. The other thing is, to say about this um, particular incident with, with Betsy Lehman, I mean, it was a terrible tragedy. Her husband worked in the same hospital as a, as a research technician. Um, that she didn't die from a simple error coming out of the blue. When the authorities looked back at the hospital, they found some very, very adverse features of the culture going back a long way. And so her death, if you like, was a tragic marker of an organization that did just did not have the right culture, a degree of arrogance, and all sorts of things which were pointed out by authorities and investigators. So those are two, two, I picked those two examples, even though you might be quite familiar with them, because if you like, they're right at the simple end of, um, of medication error, an abbreviation and a calculation error, both of which could be, I think, you could get pretty close to zero if you banned abbreviations. And I think on the calculation front, there are ways also of uh, dealing with that. When I was <coughs> helping with the design of the WHO's Medication Safety Challenge, I read back on the literature and I came to an article um, by, uh, I'll come to who it was by in a minute, but that nobody had ever referred to before in the medication safety or medication error literature. And it was written by a man called Alphonse Schapanis. I don't know whether any of you uh, have heard of him or know of him. But he was one of, um, of a group of people um, in the golden era of ergonomics immediately post-war. Uh, we now tend to use the term human factors rather than ergonomics. But there was a group of people, non-medical people, often engineering scientists, who really unpacked and understood safety, almost exclusively working in industries outside healthcare. And when you read their stuff, it's unbelievably turgid and difficult to follow, very, very, very technical. I don't think many of them were inspiring speakers. But their names should be up in lights because, in fact, in the sky, they transformed uh, airline safety with this science of ergonomics. But Chapanis was one of them, <clears throat> and he took a sidestep only once early on in his career, and he did a study of medication error in a large American hospital. <clears throat> and he, as all good... Um, patient safety, or safety researchers, he wasn't a patient safety researcher, he distilled the, all the individual errors into a number of key themes. And you can see them there, there are seven of them. 1961, Alphonse Schiapanis did this work. Every one of those is still alive and kicking around the world today, causing harm to patients. So the huge tragedy and irony in the fact that between the work of the ergonomics experts in the 1960s and even before that, 50s and 60s, all the other industries that they'd observed and worked in were transformed, have been transformed in safety terms over that time. Health, they weren't particularly interested in, but when they did look, they found the same sorts of things, but that transformation wasn't picked up by the industry and carried forward. One final story, and I'm doing these stories with a purpose. You will have heard me maybe on previous occasions talk about this young man, Wayne Jowett. Um, when I was chief medical officer, I produced a report called An Organization with a Memory, which started the patient safety program in the NHS. And the intrathecal administration error was one of the case studies that I put in the report. For the non-medical people, um, 
young people receiving treatment, usually for leukemia, um, as part of their therapy get two injections, one into a vein intravenously and one into the spine intrathecally. And Wayne, like a lot of the uh, people around the world who've been subjected to this treatment, um, ended up, it was very, I met his parents five years later and they were deeply traumatized by everything that had happened. No one had spoken to them when, they, when the accident happened and they went to the clinical area. They were told three different things. He'll survive, he'll survive and be disabled. Um, he'll, be, he'll be dead within 12 hours. Th those were the three things by different clinical teams that they were told. And they were so bitter and angry that nobody had spoken to them. And the trauma they experienced was terrible. Anyway, Wayne went into hospital out of turn, out of sequence, because he was a typical rebellious teenager and he hadn't taken his, gone for his therapy. And the hospital moved to try and fit him in and the process of fitting him in went terribly wrong. And um, he received these two injections. Look at them, they're in similar syringes. The one containing vincristine, which is meant to go in a vein, has a warning not for intrathecal use. But the two young doctors who were stepping in trying to help injected him in the wrong way, and he was paralyzed and died. And his mother told me that when she went to see him in the intensive care unit, he asked her, Mum, am I going to die? And she told me that she had to tell her own son that he was going to die, and it was the most terrible moment she could ever have imagined in her life. So one of the things we did, and I used to hate people that play videos in presentations. I didn't ever think I'd be one of them, but I've got a very short snippet from an educational video, and I'm showing you because it's been so powerful in educational terms around the world. And it's, a, it's the story, not of Wayne exactly, but of the many cases like his, which, uh, where something goes wrong, where good people are trying to do the right thing, and inadvertently, they do the wrong thing. Is that okay? Okay, fine. Thin Christine, two milligrams in two mils. Right. Okay, that's it. Got a plaster? Hold you up. You can't have finished already. Yeah, we have, yeah. I've got the methotrexate. So, what have you given her? Oh, my God. Can someone call Dr. Monroe, please? So I've been out of clinical practice for many, many years in public health and management, but I, I can feel myself in that moment. And I know a lot of young doctors and medical students and nursing students who uh, have seen the video have found the same thing. They feel what's going on. And that's, I think, a really good example of the sort of educational material that we need to produce. It's the granularity and the and the human nature of it that, that draws people in and they never forget. So, um, my mother was a great Agatha Christie fan and she always was saying to me, Liam, you ought to read this. And I was always too busy. She's, she's long passed away now, but she would often say to me, but you've got to read this one, Liam, because it's got a twist in the tail. You remember that expression for the little bit on the plot that adds in? 
Well, the Vin Christine story has a twist in the tale. Just to recap, it's a rare catastrophic event. It's a very good one to study because it is a classic accident with multiple factors interacting. There were something like 70 cases worldwide when we first started to study it. And since new guidance was put out, new measures to try and resolve it, um, there were other cases in Southern California, in Hong Kong, and in South Korea, and probably elsewhere, but those were the ones that were reported. So there was no international learning at all from this sort of um, effort that was put into it. But the twist in the tale is this. Suddenly, I woke up one morning uh, when I was chief medical officer, and somebody rang me from the Department of Health and said, there have been 100 cases of uh, Vin Christine paralysis. And I couldn't believe it. I thought, my, my job is on the line here. We said we'd eliminate it. And suddenly, 100 cases, where are they? And he said, uh, in China. And what had happened after a long investigation is that a drug manufacturing plant that was manufacturing two drugs, Vin Christine, and the one that's genuinely intended for intrathecal use safely, the traces of the vincristine had contaminated the other drug. So that when it was legitimately used for intrathecal use, it paralyzed patients, and most of them died, right across China. Now, who would have thought it? We'd studied and studied and studied how this vincristine error could occur, but we never thought of going upstream to that extent. So the general point there, I think, the general patient safety point is... Um, we have to scope the whole, all the possible elements of a chain of harm in order to be sure. And just for good measure, and this is particularly shocking, this was Agatha Christie with two twists in the tale. So here's another one. This was a publication in a medical journal about a rare complication of uh, my, multiple myeloma, where the authors recommended the use of intrathecal vincristine for treating this condition. Can you imagine it? Recommended its use. It was an online journal, so it was quickly redacted when the experts got on to the editor, but how many people had read it? Fortunately, it's a rare condition, but a total unawareness of this problem. So that's the story of Vin Christine. There are many, many, many lessons there uh, to be unpacked. But, but basically, a story of slow, slow, slow learning. And what we did in the UK is we pursued the creation. Because we, we immediately, Wayne Jowett died, I got a torrent of letters from doctors saying to me, you idiot, all you have to do is to commission a device that connect, you can't connect to that sort of syringe. But then we looked into it and it affected the whole of the lure and non-lure connection system. Plus the devices industry weren't interested because they didn't think it was a big enough market. So it took 10 years until we eventually managed to get a shamefully long time, a device which was a fail safe. So all of these influences on medication safety, you've heard about them look-alike, sound-alike medicines, handwriting, violation of procedures, ignorance, what I've talked about today, um, numeracy, all of these things and many more contribute to why things go wrong in medication safety. In 2006, the WHO's program was founded. I was the first, first chair of the World Alliance for Patient Safety. And early on, we, as part of a range of programs, we decided to have the first global patient safety challenge. We wanted something that united the world, and we thought nothing would unite it more than healthcare infection. So we set up the uh, first challenge, Clean Care is Safer Care. The flagship element of that was the um, hand hygiene program. Until then, alcohol rubs were hardly ever used in hospitals around the world. And then secondly, with the help of Dr. Atul Gwandi, we, um, we introduced the 
safe, the safe surgery checklist. The first challenge we did by getting ministers around the world to sign a pledge to commit to a program of action on reducing healthcare infection. And over time, uh, the program covered something like, it now covers 90% of the world. Now, this is soft, it's not easily measurable, we can't demonstrate big outcomes. But what we did learn from it is that these challenges can galvanize action. But they have to be something that inspires people, they have to be um, simple. Ideally, they have to have what Malcolm Gladwell calls a sticky element, the, the alcohol gels were people immediately understood the clean hands message and the surgical checklist and the parallel with the airline industry, people immediately uh, understood that. So in designing the next challenge, we're seeking to create the same sort of excitement and um, action and engagement, particularly at the political level, which is terribly important in this sort of change. So the third challenge has been launched. You've heard a little bit about its target. We agonized about a target, but everybody advised that in global health, unless you have something clear cut, there are too many competing priorities and you'll never get on the political agenda. You might get on the uh, professional agenda, but to get on the political uh, agenda, you've got to be bold and ambitious. We're doing it by, I think, quite a clever technique of devolving responsibility for working out the detailed programs to the countries themselves. So we have four domains, health professionals, what they can do and what, what causes medication harm in their area, medicines as products, um, processes and procedures, including regulation, and then patients and the public. And so the idea is that each country would set up its own national group in these four areas. And I think the clever part of it, compared to the previous challenges, is that the sh it would be likely that you would then get a community of experts and patients and others who would grow up to form these groups and ultimately be part of the program of change, process of change. But in addition to that, we've picked th three flagship elements after careful consultation. One is um, high-risk medicines, and we'd be asking the country themselves to pick for their country which is the best high-risk medicine to, will it be anticoagulants, what will it be? Will it be non-steroid um, anti-inflammatory, what will it be? But something measurable and where rapid progress on the source of harm can be made. Polypharmacy, um, we were talking about this, I visited some hospitals. There was one hospital I visited in, in the UK which I talked to the pharmacist who was doing the uh, discharges of the elderly patients at the weekend who'd got better and were leaving. And he said he'd, he'd given, um, he'd filled prescriptions for um, five patients who'd gone out with uh, 12 drugs each. And this is not uncommon when I talk to colleagues around the country. So polypharmacy, and then the other one, the transitions of care, the errors that occur when people move from primary to secondary, from hospital to hospital, from nursing home to hospital. So the medication safety challenge is up and running. Secretary Hunt is one of the first health ministers to sign up, and we're delighted about that, that the UK is showing a lead. Um, the Middle Eastern region, uh, particularly with um, countries like Oman, have also signed up. So we'll be working very, very hard. But the key to it is to grow that community of experts and, and enthusiasts in the countries concerned. Because with the other challenges, we had infectious control experts, we had surgeons, so we, you know, the infrastructure was there, but here we need to bring people together and it's best done at local level where they can determine their own priorities and then hopefully the thing will be sustained and grow and will become, Joe, a movement just like yours where you've shown such expertise in how to establish a movement. So I'm going to finish. Uh, Joe was asking me about Churchill and his associations here. Did, have you seen the film, the recent film about Churchill? Have any of you seen that? I, I went to see it. Um, there's one lovely point where he's, he's under the cosh with 
his political opponents in Parliament, including his own party. And he wins the day uh, with a great speech, as usual. And um, one of the characters in the, uh, who were plotting against him and have had to throw in the towel said to his colleague, this, this was in the film, um, he's mobilized the English language and sent it into battle. And I think, um, so I was thinking, I, when I thought about that, we, we've heard some great inspiring words today. And um, so I thought, well, what, how would we mobilize the English language and, um, to tackle this problem? And uh, I remember all the, all the um, uh, polls about people's favorite song in the UK, it always comes out with Imagine by John Lennon. And I've always thought Imagine is one of the most powerful words in the English language. And in the field of safety and reducing harm, I think zero is the most powerful word that you could have. So I end by saying to you, Let's mobilize, imagine zero, and go into battle against avoidable harm. Thank you.